Well, let's dive into our passage this morning. I was reading this week a little bit about DNA and genetics. Every time I read about this, it just blows my mind. So DNA is like, I don't know, like the building blocks of life, and they tell you how to make a person or something. I don't know. It's about the extent of my knowledge of genetics. And it always boggles my mind because the level of information involved is, is, is really incredible. And, of course, it's our DNA that ends up making us the kind of person we are. And so, interestingly, I am a redhead. Anyone else out there consider yourselves a redhead? None. Oh, there's a couple. Excellent, excellent. So did you know that we are like genetic superheroes? So I want to talk a little bit about myself this morning as a redhead. Okay, my people, where are you? A few of you. All right, so listen. So this is a very small percentage of the population. Uh, the red hair gene is controlled by a, a very rare gene that's recessive, so it's hard to get everything to line up right. Though apparently there's like eight different genes involved. And so when you, when you spin the wheel of genetics, it's kind of like starting a video game when you pick a character. A lot of times you have to choice make. I want to be this kind of character, this kind of background. Whatever you pick, it gives you certain strengths and weaknesses. Well, if you are playing the video game of life and you choose to be a redhead, you get some incredible strengths but also some weaknesses. First, some weaknesses. With our pale skin, we are very vulnerable to ultraviolet light damaging our skin. So my doctor flat out told me one day, he's like, yeah, you'll get skin cancer one day. Like, oh, great. Thanks. Okay, so like there's the downside. But the superpower is this. Recently confirmed again in a 2020 study in experimental dermatology, uh, uh, redheads are more efficient at synthesizing vitamin D because we are designed for like northern climates where it's dark and gloomy. So we need far less sunlight to make the required amount of vitamin D. So this is why I'm so happy and cheerful in the winter. <laughs> because I, I'm made for long nights and not much sunshine. I can synthesize that pretty fast. Um, a weakness is though redheads apparently feel pain from cold and hot worse than other people. So that's definitely a downside. Though I've trained this one out of my system, I think, for many years uh, in the sauna and snow, so that doesn't bother me anymore. On the other hand, redheads are more pain resistant, particularly to electrical shock pain and sharp stabbing pains. Come at me, bro. You can't hurt me. That's pretty good, you know. That's pretty good. I like that. So our DNA lines us up to be the kind of person we are. Uh, but the language of DNA is also used metaphorically sometimes to apply to organizations. We'll talk about a company's DNA, meaning what? Kind of those factors and qualities that make them what they are. And this language can be applied to churches as well. What is the DNA of a church? Well, we're going through a 10-week series that is starting today, which I'm calling Core 10. And we're going to be zeroing in every week at one of our church's core values that we articulated uh, last year. If you flip your insert about the sermon over to the back, you'll see I've given you these uh, 10 different core values. And this is our DNA, if you will. Uh, these are those things that we want to shape us and mark us as a church. And, and in this sense, the idea of a core value is something more specific than a mission. So if you look on the screen, here is a, a little diagram with our church's mission statement in the middle. So look at our uh, mission statement here. Worship God, love people, make disciples. Okay, I love it. It's a great mission statement. But notice that mission statement more or less should be shared by like a lot of churches. So there should be a lot of commonalities in missions between churches. Because if you've got a church that's a, you know, following the Bible, teaching the gospel, it's going to be concerned with these sorts of things, worshiping God, loving people, and making disciples. So oftentimes what leads to a lot of the distinctivenesses about churches is not so much of their mission, but more something we could describe using the language of core values. So these are more detailed. These are more specific these are the ways that God has called a particular church to live out its mission. And so with different core values, you can end up with a different DNA. So the churches may share similar missions. They can end up expressing that differently. So I think this will be a valuable 10 weeks for us because we're going to be able to zero in on all 10 of these key aspects of who we want to be as a church. Uh, but also all 10 of these things are also pretty well tied up with what it means to live as well as a faithful Christian. So this will also hopefully be beneficial for us as we think about it at that level. Now, when we, when we weighed through these core values last year, 
we prayerfully said, okay, what are some of our actual core values? In other words, what are some things about our church that really is our DNA? And we articulated a variety of these. But we also recognized, okay, what about some things that we want to be living out as a church that maybe we're not doing so well? So we could call these aspirational values. So as you look over this list of 10, the fact that we've articulated these 10 doesn't necessarily mean we think we're doing a good job at all of these. Some of these we put there because it's areas in which we know we want to grow. So today we're going to zero in on the fourth of these core values because the order doesn't really matter so much. So why don't you flip your outline uh, over to the other side and we will start going through this together. Okay, so here's part one. Here's the core value that we're going to explore here today. And, and notice I've given it to you on your outline. Our phrase here is transformation over stagnation. Transformation over stagnation. That rhymes. Look at this picture. What is stagnation? Stagnation is kind of an image from a body of water. And if you've got a lake or something that has a continual inflow of fresh water and continual outflow of water, it'll stay clean and fresh. But if you have a body of water that just sits there and there's no movement, it eventually gets stagnant. Now, that's good for some things, like frogs and turtles, but it's not good for other things like for people to drink. So what we're saying with this core value is, speaking individually and collectively, we don't want to just be stuck where we are spiritually. We want to be individually and together in a continual process of growth, of discipleship, on the path of following Jesus, uh, growing more and more like him, and obeying those things that he has told us to do. So here's what we're after for this. And you can unpack the details of that little explanation statement later. Let's turn to what's more important, part two, the scriptural mandate for this. Because the, what we articulated here is clearly something that God is calling us to as believers, both as a church, uh, but also as individuals. So here's part two, our scriptural mandate. And I'm going to try each week to pull a passage from the Old Testament and then a passage from the New Testament. So we see that these things are something that God has been concerned about in the lives of his people uh, all throughout the history of salvation. So here's the first passage we're going to look at today. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Why don't you read this out loud with me off your outline. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. That is a beautiful passage. That is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, sharing his heart for his people. And notice what this passage calls us to is a real flip-flopping of values. Because look, there's three good things mentioned here. Wisdom, strength, riches, all things being equal, people want to be wise or stupid. Yeah, we want to be wise. We want to be smart. People want to be strong or weak. Well, all things being equal, we want to be strong. Do we want to be rich or poor? Well, that lottery's up to a billion dollars again, I see. All things being equal, we'd rather be rich. And all three of those things are treated positively sometimes in some parts of Scripture. But what we see here is a flip-flop of values where even these good things, God says, are completely outweighed by the most important thing. And what is that most important thing here? Look at verse 24. Let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. Kind of hear echoes of Jesus there. What's it gain a person if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul, Jesus says. It's the same sort of flip-flop of values here. Notice, unfortunately, it doesn't say, know about me, does it? Uh, let the one boast, boast about this, that they have the understanding to know about me. Well, that's easier. So notice there's a difference here between knowing about God and knowing God himself. This seems to be implying a relational element. This is more than just facts known about God. So here's where we see the language 
that we often use of having a relationship with God, as fuzzy as that is and as hard as that can be sometimes to envision with a, an entity we can't see. Well, what does this kind of knowledge entail, though? 24, again, the one who boasts, boasts about this. They have the understanding to know me. And look how God describes himself, that I am the Lord, Yahweh, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. That word kindness is the the famous key Old Testament Hebrew word, hesed. It's God's loyal love, his kindness, his grace, his faithfulness to his people, a kind of loyalty. And this is the attitude we see from God towards his people all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. God's grace, his kindness, his patience. The other words there, justice and righteousness. So on one hand, these ideas have to do with punishing people that do what's wrong. We see plenty of that from God, negatively. But positively, these words also have the idea of establishing peace, uh, of protecting the marginalized, uh, defending those who are abused and hurt and standing up for them. In other words, God is saying here he delights in kindness, in right conduct, in peace, in a society where we do what is right. Look at the last line, for in these I delight. What's the implication of that one? What is the implication for us, God's people, if God says, here's what I delight in, kindness, justice, and righteousness, what is that implying? All right? These are things that are supposed to mark us as God's people. So part of what it is going to mean to know God to have a relationship with him is going to be living out these virtues, love, loyalty, faith, faithfulness, justice, right conduct, all of these sorts of things. So notice what's more important than the job, what's more important than health, what's more important than romance, what's more important than honor, Um, you name it. If there is a God in existence, By definition, the most important thing then in all of existence is going to be rightly relating to him. This is what God tells us here. Let not the rich man boast of his riches, the wise of his wisdom, but rather let the one who boasts that they know me. So what's most important is our relationship with him. Kind of like what Levi said earlier, command number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's turn to the New Testament. Here's a key passage out of Paul. This is Philippians 3. And the key, the tie-in here is, you'll see how both of these passages zero in on this call to know God, to be in this relationship with God. And for Paul, writing in the New Testament, how do we know God? How are we in relationship with God? It is now done through the person of Jesus, who is God's perfect expression and entry into the world. We know God now in the face of Christ. And we see Paul talking about it this way. So look here on your outline, Philippians 3, 7 to 17. Now, Paul just wrote about his way of life before he was a Christian, his devotion to the traditions of his people. And look what he says, starting in verse 7. He's talking about now after he believed in Jesus, turned his life around. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Again, there's that flip-flop of values. Gains and losses. This is the language of business. If you run a business, you have expenses, you have profits. You have assets, you have liabilities. Things that are of a value, things that are dragging you. And Paul says, look, those things that I once thought as assets, those things that I valued as, as advantages to me, once I became a believer in Jesus, Paul says, not only did I consider them nothing, I now considered them loss. Those assets went to liabilities for Paul because his values flip-flopped completely. He now considers them less than nothing for the sake of Christ, he says. When Paul became a believer in Jesus, he didn't get the nice mansion. He didn't get the televangelist special with the wife with the big hair and the fancy car and the Learjet. Uh, When Paul became a missionary, when Paul followed Jesus, he got rejection, abuse, poverty, suffering, and hardship. He says, you know what? It's okay. I consider all those things less than nothing compared to the sake of knowing Christ.
Christ. Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. This week I sat with a friend and we read a short passage out of Augustine's famous book from the 4th century, Confessions. Listen to this one line as Augustine is writing to God in his kind of private prayer journal. And look what Augustine says to God. Too little does any man love you who loves some other thing together with you, loving it not on account of you. O you love who is ever burning and never extinguished. Augustine still speaks to us 1,600 years later because of his passion and love for God and his desire for him above all else. I think Paul would resonate with this line from Augustine. To love something alongside God is not even right unless we love it on account of God. Psalm 73 says, the psalmist speaking to God, whom have I in heaven but you and earth has nothing I desire apart from you. This is the the expression of a heart that has flip-flopped its values and values the knowledge of God above all else. Look what he says here. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. What is them? What's the antecedent of that pronoun, them? All things. It says, I consider all things garbage. Now, our Bible translations are being polite there. Uh, This Greek word, it does mean garbage very often, but it also often has the specific meaning of human poop. So notice what the New English translation says. I regard them as dung, just like the old King James did. That's very probably the idea here. Uh, Look at this line right out of our standard Greek lexicon. Look at the suggestion they give here. Quote, to convey the crudity of the Greek, it's all crap. Yeah, it's in there. The Bible doesn't do what we expect all the time. Paul says, I consider all things crap compared to the knowledge of Christ, compared to this relationship with God through Jesus, that I may gain Christ, verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Here's the beautiful doctrine of what we call justification, that we are made right with God. We're declared righteous in God's sight, not really by being good, because we could never be good enough, But this is why Jesus came. He died on the cross for our sins. He absorbed God's wrath on our behalf. And he rose from the dead. God declared Jesus righteous by raising him from the dead. And when we believe in Jesus, we are united with Jesus. So his death becomes our death. And God declares us righteous. It's called justification. In fact, if I were you, I'd write it in right there. Right by verse 9. Just write down justification. This is that gift of a right standing that God gives us when we believe in Jesus, not because of us, but because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. This means as a status in God's eyes, if you have believed in Jesus, you are righteous. You are forgiven in his sight. And that is profoundly good news. But he goes on here, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Notice the connection. When you believe in Jesus, the other thing that happens is God gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells within us. And I think this is probably the mechanism for our union with Jesus. We are united to Jesus by the Holy Spirit, so his death becomes our death. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Look at verse 10. I want to know Christ. Now again, Paul does not say, I want to know about Christ. Does he? Again, he's aiming beyond that, just like Jeremiah did. He wants to know Jesus intimately, as hard as that is to conceptualize with a being we can't see. This is a relationship we will be dependent upon God for. Paul goes on to explain what it means to know Christ. Look, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Well, what will be the power of his resurrection? Well, one day it will mean physically being raised from the dead with Jesus when he comes back, absolutely. But Paul is also talking about here the power of that resurrection in this life now. 
So we can see what Paul means here by looking at some parallel passages. We'll just look at one. Look at Romans 6, 4. Look what he says here. He says, what's happened to you if you are a baptized Christian? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So the power of the resurrection that Paul wants to know is the power of, look, what it says in Romans, a new life. The power of God to bring transformation in this life. This is part of the power of the resurrection. So why don't you write there by this verse, sanctification. It's another good churchy word for us. Justification refers to the initial beginning when we're forgiven. Status, forgiven, righteous. And the rest of our lives then becomes a process of what we call sanctification. Growing more holy, more like Jesus. Trying to live out what he wants us to be. So stage one of the Christian life, justification, the gift of righteousness. Stage two, our struggle in sanctification to be more like Jesus. Well, keep going. There is no, I got bad news for you, actually. There is no sanctification without suffering. Look at the next line. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his what? Death. So make no mistake. As you seek to follow Jesus, the process of sanctification for you will be as much a process of death as it is a process of life. As you experience new things and newness, it will also be a kind of suffering and dying as you struggle to put to death aspects of who you are that you know are out of step with God. Odds are you will not have to suffer persecution like Paul did. But you absolutely will have to suffer the struggle and the fight with the flesh and putting to death the desires that go contrary to what God wants for you. So this sanctification process necessarily will involve suffering. Can't escape it. If you follow the Messiah who suffered before he was honored and glorified, this will also necessarily be your path. Sorry, it's the way it works. We follow a crucified Savior, not a Learjet Savior. I made that up. It's not very good, though. Not very catchy. I don't like it. Verse 11. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. There's the final phase. Right there, glorification. This means that Jesus' return in all of its stages, we are resurrected, transformed. Sanctification is complete. Justification is sealed and finalized. All evil is stripped from us. We live with him forever. So these are the phases of the Christian life. We see them all right here in these verses. Justification, the gift of forgiveness. Sanctification, the struggle to obey and to grow in suffering. And one day at Jesus' return, final glorification, all is well. Look at verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Did Paul consider himself perfect? Or was he still struggling in sanctification? Yep. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now you might look at yesterday and say, you know what, yesterday was a spiritual disaster for me. You might look at last month. You say, you know what, last month, I went, my life went off the rails. Maybe you look at the last 10 years, you're like, you know what, the last 10 years for me have been horrific. You may look at the past and just be filled with shame and be like, oh my gosh, I have sinned so much. I have failed God so greatly. I have taken such little advantage of the grace and the opportunity he's given me. Most of us can. Probably all of us, if we're honest. But I love Paul's attitude here. In a sense, does it matter what happened yesterday? Nope, it's gone. Does it matter what happened 10 years ago? In a sense, nope, it's gone. Notice all we have is today and all we have is tomorrow. So I love this attitude here. Look at this. One thing I do, Paul says, forgetting what is behind. Paul was burdened and grieved with how in his past he persecuted and killed Christians. Like you think you've done bad stuff, you killed any believers in Jesus because they were Christians? Probably not. 
This troubled Paul and continued to trouble him. But look what he was able to say. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He knows this is forgiven. So it does him no good to dwell on it. Rather, he's like, nope, tomorrow. Pressing ahead. And I think this is the attitude we have to take in our sanctification and following of Jesus as well. Forgetting what is behind. So we press on. We don't give up. We confess our sins to God. We ask for forgiveness. Trust we're forgiven. And keep going. Attack. Forward. Not looking back. Verse 15. Great line. (laughs) All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. That's good. Do you want to be mature? You want to be a strong Christian? Paul says this is how we should think about stuff. Meaning what? The flip-flop of values and also struggling in sanctification, forgetting what is behind, straining forward to be obedient to Christ and serving him. This is the way we want to think about things. I love this line too. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Now Paul had his moments of being heavy-handed. Like you got to believe this, you got to do this. This was not one of them. Here he backed off and said, you know what? This is how we should think about this, Philippians. This is what you should do. But if you disagree with me, you know what? God will point you in the right direction. I like that attitude too. I don't like this next verse, though. Verse 16, don't like it at all. We should probably skip it. Yeah, look at that. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. You know, maybe you've been a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus for a long time, 10 years, 20 years. Honestly, our problem is not really that we need to know more things most of the time. The problem is we need to really actually live out and do the things we know. So notice this seems to be a challenge like, okay, it's not so much necessarily about what's the new thing, what do I need to do? Part of this is just, look, just live up to what you've attained in following Christ. Just keep doing those same normal things. Look back. What are those things you used to do that marked a more vibrant time with God? Do those things. Don't go backwards. Return to these things. Now look at these last few lines and consider them in in light of this topic today of transformation and discipleship. Actually, the last verse we'll look at. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So notice in this struggle of sanctification, in the journey of transformation, not stagnation, this is not something intended to be us on our own, by ourselves, me in my room with my Bible exclusively. Okay, that is very important. But notice Paul assumes and commands that this journey of transformation, sanctification, and growth by necessity involves other people. And so let's put our hat on of, okay, we want to influence others for Jesus, Part of this means we need to live a certain way so we're able to say to people, hey, imitate me. Do what I do. Do those things I'm doing. And likewise, if you want to grow spiritually, you want to grow in discipleship, one key mechanism that Paul says is look around. You find some Christian that is living the way you want to, and you copy them, you imitate. Go to them and say, well, hey, what do you do? I want to do what you do. So notice this process of discipleship and transformation is by necessity something that's also communal, within the fellowship of the church. So together we experience this ongoing transformation, not stagnation. Okay, bottom line. What is it? Let's put it this way. Recommit to the quest to know Jesus. It's a new year. We got some new momentum. We can maybe still harness. It's the eighth. Still still in the air, New Year's resolutions. Well, let's recommit to the most important thing. This quest, this journey that we are called to of knowing Christ. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him personally. Two, three suggestions how. First, by flipping your values once again. We got to do this continually. Continually, we must be reminded, was, okay, what matters in life is not the skill, not the power, not the health, not the acclaim, not the money. Those things don't really matter. What really matters is knowing God. What really matters is living out those virtues that he delights in. This is what matters. And we got to continually be telling ourselves this because we listen to a lot of songs in the world metaphorically trying to convince us otherwise of different values. Second, by participating in Christ's sufferings as you discipline your life towards him. Uh, Look at this picture. This is our 
discipleship map or growth map here. And notice the top right says living in rhythm. This is what this is talking about. Building into our lives the habits, the rhythms of a follower of Jesus. And that is a kind of suffering. It's easier just to do what we want in the moment all the time. An aspect of suffering and death is building in deliberate rhythms and practices of a disciple of Jesus so that God's Spirit can transform us the way we want Him to. Now, that suffering, that death brings life. But there is an aspect of suffering and hardship to it. So think about it. What are those practices that you used to engage in that helped you connect with God? Get back to it. Live up to what you've already attained to. Or maybe you don't know what to do. Come talk to us. We'll help you. Join our Rooted program, which focuses on seven rhythms of life for a disciple of Jesus. Third, by engaging in the community of the church as part of this transformation. Again, this, is, this can't be a solo job just between you. Uh, we need that life in community. And there's a ton of Bible studies, small group opportunities, and all this sorts of thing. All right, I want to invite my friend Justin to come up here. We're going to interact a little bit. I want to ask him a couple questions. Come on up here, Justin. Give Justin a big hand as he comes, please. There you go. Okay, um, we got some people going out to get ready for something. It doesn't mean church is done. Hi, Justin. Hello. Your mic working? Why don't you keep talking into it? I think so. All right, good. Justin is one of our elders. Uh, He has teamed up with me uh, to help oversee the discipleship ministries of the church, and Justin is particularly leading the charge on our rooted ministry. So a question, and it would be a big answer. We don't have a ton of time. Justin, in your, in your life in the church, why do you think it is sometimes we struggle to grow spiritually so much? I think in my own life, I've, I've wanted to grow closer to God, but often not know how. Often not known how. Not, right. So what helped you figure that out over the years? I think I've been lucky enough to have men in my life people in my life along the way, groups in my life along the way uh, that have spurred me on, filled my knapsack, if you will, on the pilgrimage of, of uh, my spiritual life. Um, there's certainly a place for that in the basement, prayer, on the knees, you know, th- study on my own, uh, but as often in the context of other people that, that see things in you that you don't see yourself. So you're saying some of those opportunities with other people really made a difference for you? Absolutely. I mean, we often can think the worst of ourselves, or sometimes we think the best of ourselves, <laughs> and, um, and don't see those things that are maybe God's trying to communicate. And he uses other people. And sometimes that's easy, and sometimes that's not easy. So we're sort of unveiling our flagship discipleship program, if you will, here, called Rooted. Ten-week structured small group experience. We're going to do three cycles of this a year. Um, Tell us about this, Justin. Why do you think this is valuable and important for someone to plug into at some point over the course of their time here at our church? Well, I'm not a redhead. Oh, well. But... Clearly, it's awesome. Ah. Um, no, uh, in all seriousness, I, I think we all have that door in our heart that Jesus is knocking on. And maybe it's the front door when he's not in the house. But a lot of us, maybe he's already in the house. And there's been a, there is or has been a closed door in that house. And I think he knocks on it. Hmm. And he's not going to force his way in. He's not going to shove his way in. But why should you do anything spiritual? I don't know, because tap, tap, tap. Hmm. He nudges our heart, and if he's nudging you to do a rooted group, the beautiful thing is there you have assurance that that's, he, he's calling you to that. So he, you have assurance of his grace and his mercy and his tenderness and kindness in, in leading you through it. Cool. So this cycle is going to be Sunday afternoons, starts 12.30, goes to 2.30. Lunch will be included. This starts next week. 
Uh, you have a book you take home, you read through, you take notes, you come together and discuss with the other people in the group. Uh, Karina has put together a wonderful children's curriculum that goes along with this. So child care is included, and it's not just babysitting. Uh, the kids are being taught and trained in the same sorts of material that the parents are going through. Uh, the cost for this is 50 bucks a person, which is a lot. Covers your books and some other things. Uh, however, I got a text this morning from someone in our church that felt God calling them to, to give a sizable donation to help with some scholarship money. So we don't want money to uh, stop you from being involved in this. So you can prayerfully consider this. Now, if you want to sign up, you got to do it by Tuesday because it kicks off next week. I gave you a little card in your bulletin. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering box or reach out to us uh, sometime during the week. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us, your loyalty to us. And I thank you for these friends behind me, Father, and, and their willingness to come up and share just in, just in a snapshot this aspect of a part of their story with you. Father, it is our desire to know you. Uh, we, we recognize there are so many things in our world and so many things in our heart that resist that. So we ask for your mercy. We ask you to fill us uh, with your spirit and direct us on the path of knowing you more. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.